All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with today's uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, just one moment, uh, Randy will uh, be presenting, and uh, we'll start uh, going through today's uh, discussion. Super glad everybody could join us. Um, so one of the first things um, I'd like to uh, recommend that uh, you become familiar with is um, our question and answer function um, that is part of the webinar app, uh, the uh, WebEx application. So if you look in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you're going to see um, that you have a Q and A uh, um, option. And what we'd like to invite you to do is anytime during today's uh, webinar, if you have a question, go ahead and type that in there and go ahead and ask all panelists. And uh, what we'll be doing is taking those questions and responding to them um, in real time, maybe through the Q&A, or we're going to be bringing those into the conversation um, to uh, do that. So I'd like to thank Jonathan. Uh, he found it and uh, we got your test. Thank you, sir. Uh, so please uh, make sure you're using that and letting us know if you have any questions throughout. All right. All right, Randy, we can go on to uh, the next one. So uh, today's webinar is focusing on recreating your trust, uh, trust with your guests and retraining your teams. Uh, first, I'd like to kind of go through what our agenda is going to look like today. Uh, so we do have uh, an hour and a half that's set aside for this webinar. Um, probably the first 75 um, minutes of that webinar, we're going to be doing a, a fair amount of discussion. Um, that discussion is going to be with our, our esteemed panelists um, and industry experts, um, but it's also going to include your questions that you um, submit in through the, the chat. Um, we'll then follow that up with, um, at the end, any additional questions and answers that we might have. Um, we do, uh, uh, one of the big things that we are trying to focus on with all these webinars is making sure that we're as inclusive as possible. Um, and so you might have noticed that there's no restrictions on, on who could attend because we really want to make sure that we're coming together as an industry and that this isn't just one company's, um, you know, customers or anything like that. This is really um, something that benefits the entire industry. Um, so there is a chance that we do have press um, and public uh, attending. We would like to ask if there are any members of the press that are uh, joining us today, if you could just kind of let us know in the questions and answers, um, just so that we understand who's here. And what we'd love to do is if you have any questions that come up throughout this um, and you would like to be connected directly with a panelist, um, maybe to kind of uh, better understand a question or, that, or an answer that they provided, uh, that we're happy to do that. So if you could just let us know in the questions and answers if you're uh, attending. We would appreciate that. And, uh, and Randy, great. So um, we are on uh, kind of our, I think, uh, seventh now webinar in, in this uh, Wednesday webinar where we're focusing on recreating trust with your guests and retraining your staff. Um, if this is your first webinar that you're attending, you'll notice these six others that happened before it. Um, those are all available on the gatewayticketing.com website. So if you wanted to go back and understand what we were talking about last week when we really focused on what a, uh, the experience within the attraction looks like um, when we're having to limit um, usage of it, um, you can uh, view any of those webinars um, and, and see those, that information. Uh, next week, we are going to be focusing, as I mentioned, on pricing. And then we've got several more webinars planned for the rest of May. So please continue to join us. Yeah, um, and we're still working on our content, everybody. This is Randy. So yeah, we're going to be with you through through the end of May, so the 13th, 20th, and 27th. To catch up, you can use this QR code, and you can see what's going on in our community as well. Um, it's funny. Um, I actually, I don't refer to this as week seven webinar. This is, I think, this is week eight or nine without a professional haircut is the way I'm looking at it right now. I've had, um, I have had the, the wife haircut already, but I'm, I'm learning a lot about my hair. I, I usually keep it pretty high and tight, and I think Tennessee is opening just in time for me to, to trim up my hair. So I, I'm sure that you're all feeling the same pain that I am going through. So my name's Randy. I work at Gateway Wildlife and Conservation Principal. Uh, my, my partner helping me out with these is Matthew, who you just met. So there's Matthew. And um, we have amazing, amazing guest panelists today that I'm really excited um, to have on. Um, these two gentlemen are, are, are great in our industry. They do such awesome stuff. Um, we have Josh Lehman joining us. Um, he's the Director of Business Development from Amusement Advantage, and his insight is most valuable about guests, understanding um, your guest position in, in your attraction. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves 
uh, shortly. Um, and then we also have Matt Heller joining us uh, from Performance Optimist Consulting. Now, um, Matt, is, is he and I work together with a lot of uh, instruction-led content for IAPA. So um, he and I go way back, and he's uh, an expert in the HR industry. Now, collectively, both these gentlemen together um, have a little hobby. And um, Matt and Josh, you guys can say hello uh, to everyone, uh, but you guys are the attraction pros as well. And I thought it would be good for you guys to say hello to everybody now and talk a little bit about what you guys do together um, on these podcasts. Uh, Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we've had this podcast for a little over uh, two and a half years now. Uh, as you can see, this week was episode 139. So we started this really to bring uh, a resource to the industry where we had the opportunity to not only share our expertise from guest experience and from leadership development, but also to be able to interview several uh, industry leaders. Um, uh, throughout really uh, the entire industry. So between theme parks, zoos, museums, aquariums, water parks, family entertainment centers, trampoline parks, and both on the operator and supplier side of the business. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've, we've had phenomenal conversations with, uh, with some amazing people. And uh, we, have a, we have a great guest coming up uh, in uh, next week's episode actually is uh, with Randy Jocelyn here. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And both of you guys have great industry knowledge. You've worked at parks, um, you've been operators, you've worked in HR, so your perspective is going to be great. So a lot of what you'll be sharing with us today is really about what you're doing today, but also drawing on that past experience. So it's going to be super valuable. Um, we have a great friend um, joining us as well. Uh, Diana Vega um, is the guest services manager, which is uh, the title that means she does everything. Um, I've, I've known <laughs> Diana for a long time. And Diana, um, you offer a great perspective working at a zoo, but also working for uh, Miami-Dade County. So you've got the government perspective, the zoo perspective. You work with lots of staff. So um, we're really excited to have you. You can say hello to everyone as well. Hi, everybody. Um, Diana um, is going to share with us that insight about working with employees and what they're doing down in Miami. Um, and then uh, I would say a few weeks ago, we had Kelly Boles join us. She's one of our our team members here at Gateway, but her perspective is fantastic. She is a self-declared mama, momager, if I'm saying that right, Kelly. Um, you worked down at the World War II Museum. Okay. Yeah, um, you started working in our industry as an ambassador at uh, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. And um, mm -hmm. I really love the perspective that you have because you work with a lot of our Gateway customers. Um, so anything related to like working from an HR side and retraining, she's going to be one of our experts. Behind the scenes, we have Bill D'Angelo. A lot of you have met him virtually already in the Q&A. I can see a lot of chats coming. Um, uh, Bill's going to help us answer questions along the way. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Matthew. He's going to give us an industry update, see what's going on in our neck of the woods and around the whole world. So here's an update um, from Matthew. I wonder if Matt lost his audio. Yeah, but I no, no. I that mute button, I got to always find it. Um, so one of the things that, that since uh, last week when we got together is um, we've gotten word that one of the uh, uh, largest water parks uh, out there is planning on reopening. I, and I think actually that's planned for uh, coming up here on May 1st. Um, and you, so Chimalong Bay is, is planning to reopen. Um, they do are, are dealing with governmental limits of 30% of, of their capacity. Uh, one of the things I think that was interesting is uh, one of the gentlemen um, from Chimelong uh, Resort participated last night in a IAPA conference uh, uh, a webinar as well. And one of the things he shared is that this 30% is a government regulation. However, there wasn't very much more than 30% that they were told. So that's one of the things that they're finding in China is that as the government maybe is starting to reopen and they're coming up with maybe certain rules, they're not really giving uh, well-defined definitions of that. Um, so specifically, is that 30% of design day? Is that 30% of uh, you know uh, an hourly capacity or the, the the areas that are open? So I think as one of the learnings there is that as we're working with our government officials um, in other areas of the world to reopen, is that we kind of get clarity on that, um, or that we understand kind of what our, our our areas that we can play in are. They also did share that they're going to be you know keeping indoor attractions closed at this time and and really focusing I, I think on the water park initially of, of reopening. Um, and that they are, you know, reducing their, their hours in staffing. 
Um, and then if we, we leave mainland China and we drop down into Hong Kong, um, one of the things that uh, is another attraction there that's getting prepared for reopening, uh, they're planning on reopening on April 30th, so here um, actually tomorrow. Um, and this, this is uh, Nyongping 360, which is a cable car service that um, is on Lantau Island that goes um, from uh, relatively sea level way up into the mountain. Um, and one of the things that they've done on their website is really started to communicate that um, messaging to instill confidence in uh, what, what they've done and what they're planning to do. Um, so it's one of the things I, th I think you find interesting is if you see some of the, the wording there is that they're, they're focusing on strengthening the prevention measures. And I think that's really important. And one of the things from an attraction standpoint we have to keep in mind is that you know, we're really leaders in making sure that safety is first and foremost. Um, so we don't want to make, make folks think that this is the first time that we cared about safety. Um, this is really maybe, you know, just additive to all the great stuff that we've been doing before. Or it's communicating the things that we are already doing and have been doing, but making sure that they know how they apply in this situation. Another thing I think that was interesting here is um, one of their measures that they're taking for um, safety is, uh, you know, exclusive uh, cabin cars for a travel party. And one of the things I think is important is that, that to be sensitive to is that that used to be a unique product that they sold. If you wanted an exclusive cabin, you could pay a little bit more. So I think as we deliver things like that and we, we, we use that moment to to pitch that as a, pro, a, a positive, right, as maybe almost a promotion or a discount, um, hey, this thing that used to, to be extra price is now included. And also it, it goes along with our safety message. So I think that's a couple of important things I took away there. Thank you, Randy. We can go on to the next one. Well, I am going to pause because oh, yeah. I'm going to a chat from Randy Otrembiak at the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. And that's something that we've been discussing um, that is unique to, to their location. Now, their, their pods or trams are much smaller, but for to get people up there as quickly as possible, they traditionally – um, have sh mixed, you know, families and people together. So that is something that's unique in the space. We're starting to see that that's an operational change that um, you're going to have to um, really adjust how you do it. And then there's also the, the cleanliness element that you're seeing. Um, there was a great IAPA web, uh, webinar last week as well, um, hosted by um, uh, Dexibit and IAPA in the Asia Pacific region. And they were talking about elevators. Um, so looking at hotels, and the rules and regulations around hotels and elevators and that some elevators are gonna be for single party use only and trying to regulate that, but then also having the government give guidelines on when you need to clean and the cleanliness aspect of, a, of an elevator and that you have to take elevators out of service just to clean them um, to the standards that they're expecting. So these are all those types of things that we're gonna really have to get much more conditioned into thinking about. If you have two or three elevators or elevators that move um, special needs guests to their attractions, you're going to need to think of a solitary environment to move them along um, and then maybe perhaps clean it before or after uh, the next party. That's great points, Randy. Thank you. One of the um, other things that on last night's um, Asia Pacific IAPA uh, webinar is they had a gentleman by the name of Jeff Chatterton, who is a, 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 an expert in crisis management. And there were a couple of key things I think that, that I took away from that um, when he was talking through what, what kind of our focus on communication needs to be right now. Um, there were two, two really important elements. One was is that right now we're probably needing to focus our communications and our skeptics. The people um, that maybe are, are questioning, well, why are you doing it this way? And, and is this going to be safe? Um, because that's really the area of, of most concern um, in, in getting stability and getting trust um, created. The other element that he shared and, I, and is available in, in one of the documents on his website, his seven cardinal rules of trust and credibility was um, avoiding answering questions with facts. Um, and I'm a very analytical person, so this, this was a bit of a shock for me, but um, he used an example of if, if you have a child that maybe wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks that there's a monster under their bed, there's, there's one way that you could run in there and say, you know what, there is absolutely no mon monster under your bed, go right back to sleep and um, walk out of the room. But most likely that's probably not the, the, the message that's truly going to help bring calm to that situation. And instead, focusing, you know, responding with emotion 
um, making a connection and leveraging empathy is probably more of the reaction. It, it's the, the having the conversation saying, yeah, you know, I used to be scared at times before that there might be a monster under the bed. And, and this is how I dealt with it. And you know, you're, you're in a, a very safe house and, and we love you and, and giving that hug, right? Those kind of, of, of ways of responding are what are going to be more apt to uh, create that trust um, and credibility as, as folks are coming back from, from this uh, uh, pandemic. That's great uh, feedback because there's a, and this is also where some, another attraction might experience something or have a challenge that's unique to them, but the guests from their perspective and through their lenses is maybe being more reactionary. And so having a really crafted communication to, to your, to your guests might involve just not talking about all the facts, but just like, no, we got your concerns and we're just going to really respond with that love and empathy that our industry is known for. Um, that's a good point. Um, next slide, here we go. Um, sorry, if anybody's wondering, I, I've got a lot of monitors going, so I'm answering questions over here and moving the slide. So if you see me visually looking around, I'm paying attention to a bunch of different content here. Um, but Matthew's, Matthew's going to share some more IAPA information as well. Yeah, so one of the other items that came out um, uh, just recently was a group of seven um, attractions in uh, Asia it had started to put together some best practices, some operational considerations, um, uh, you know, from from their region. Um, so this is, you know, not something that we'll go through in, in detail, but I kind of wanted to make sure that it, you are aware of it and you can jump over and see um, IAPA's site and, and take a look at this. Uh, there's a, every aspect of an attraction operation has some some good considerations there that I highly recommend you you taking a peek at. With that, Randy, I'll turn it over to you as we head into uh, guest and employee engagement. Awesome. And then yeah, Matthew, on on those poll results, let's let's have that one ready in a couple slides. Perfect. I would like to share some of that information. So a lot of us joined at the very beginning with some poll information. We're gonna we're gonna show some of that information. Uh, but two weeks ago, we asked the audience, really, what is it that you're really trying to get out of um, these webinars? And what are you really needing to understand from your guests? And we're starting to see many guest sentiment surveys going out and about. This is a great time to be all over LinkedIn and all over your social channels because um, the plethora of information that is out and about is great. Um, but from our specific uh, poll just a couple weeks ago, um, we had a lot of great comments from you. This, these are actually your, your questions for us and that your questions for us that you would want us to be understanding and asking of each other in this community. So today, the, the focus for today is to have all of you as participants feel free and comfortable to ask anybody on our panel and our teams these questions or ask each other. And really all these questions boil down to, I would say, three big topics. Safety um, is it, it, something that it came to mind. Uh, pricing is it, something that we see many uh, items here. Experiences and then training. Um, so um, while we start thinking about these questions and how we can get these questions answered, it's important to know like who our audience is on the webinar right now. So um, and how are we developing plans? So as you're developing plans for how your attraction operates after COVID-19, who is part of your strategy? Who is part of the team that's building these, these, these understandings of what you're going to do? And um, you can see these are your poll results. So uh, a lot of us are incorporating our guests, um, but the most of us are incorporating the senior management team. Um, and you can see some of us have, you know, over 40 plus responders that, that responded to this. It looks like that makes up about a quarter is it involving our frontline staff. So it's important to understand the strategy that we are putting forward. And we're gonna talk about a lot of this today. Who is giving you the information? Um, is, the, is the information the best information possible? Are you involving a diverse enough team that you can, can really come up with an action plan? So um, I'm gonna just jump right out and ask Diana a question. So Diana, um, we, we, we talk about strategy. Right now, you guys have been, how long have you guys been closed? Like most of us, you've probably been closed since early March. Is that right? Mid-March. Mid-March. We closed okay. mid-March, yeah. Um, so, March 18th, so somewhere on there. Okay, so you've been closed for 
uh, seven weeks, right, or six or seven weeks. Um, um, what to date? What has your strategy been to like consider how you guys might reopen? Can you share with us what you guys have been doing and who you've been involving in that strategy? Sure. So, um, as all of us probably just attending a lot of webinars and Zooms. Um, I know the first one that actually captured my uh, my attention which was the one that Josh did, actually, Josh Lieben. He did something, um, I, I forgot the title, I'm sorry, Josh, but it basically uh, laid down the groundwork for a reopening structure, a reopening plan, I'm sorry, for Zoom Miami. So he brought up two good points um, that uh, at least hit home for me was that when everybody, these, uh, these stay-at-home orders are lifted, there's probably going to be a lot of pent up demand. And then the second thing is a need to kind of escape what we just went through. So based on that, we started laying down a reopening plan. Um, I started working with my partner. We were at home most of the time and then going to the zoo a couple days of the week. So Carol B, she's on the call. Uh, but we started to um, discuss how these different options look for, look for operations. So we also met with our director, kind of told her what our um, what the industry was talking about, what are the webinars that we're attending, what are they uh, saying, these concepts, uh, these theories, and how we think it could apply to the zoo. Um, so we created, <clears throat> excuse me, over our, uh, overarching policies, procedures, and then some guidelines that we thought should help us create the reopening plan. Um, of course, as a good leader, what she did was she helped us think outside the box. She questioned a lot of why do we really need to do this? Um, and she uh, offered us the government perspective. Well, the mayor is expecting this. Parks Department is going to uh, do this. Actually, today, the parks are opening for Miami-Dade County. Uh, so Deering Estate is one of the attractions that opened today. Um, and I just heard that everything's going smoothly, so which is good. Uh, that means people are paying attention to the guidelines. Um, so we're basically, that's how we kind of started, started with um, each other, uh, laterals, uh, myself and Carol, kind of talking back and forth, and then we developed uh, something for the director to look at, then we made it more detailed, and now we're having Zoom calls with um, the managers and the supervisors, and eventually we will be um, involving Frontline, because we need to make sure they're comfortable to go ahead and implement this strategy, and they'll be part of that process as well. So Diana, are you thinking that you might change a little bit of the plans as you're involving the front line and taking their feedback in? Oh, absolutely. There's no right or wrong answer right now. We won't know until we actually open, but their opinion is, is very valuable to us. And so we want to make sure that we say, here, here are the overarching uh, guidelines and procedures that we want to follow. And we, we not only have the employees and the guests to think about, we have the animals. So we've had such a long time that we've been closed that we have to now desensitize these animals to seeing guests again. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can incorporate our volunteers' feedback. Their, their feedback is very important as well. Some of them have been at the zoo for a, a very, very long time. So what is it that they, maybe what we've been talking about is maybe bringing them in before we open and doing kind of like, hey, if, what do you think that this looks like? Do you think that the tram and what we came up with this plan looks like? I don't want to get too much into details, but um, yeah, definitely it's going to be a cohesive, uh, cohesive plan that involves all of our input. I think that's really important. Great. So um, Brett, uh, Brett Post was going to join us, and some of you guys know Brett really well, but at the last minute he was unable to attend. And Brett, Brett is a, a good friend of mine and Matt Heller's, and he works at Disneyland Resort. And Brett's been a general manager. He, um, he's worked at uh, multiple locations. He's worked with rides and attraction and food. And one of the things he was giving a perspective on was that, um, you know, at Disney, um, every, there was a stay-at-home order that went into effect in California, but they still worked. And, and really, he said that they set up like a virtual war room where for, for hours on end, the senior management teams were, were strategizing. And I think what I'm trying to share is that it seems that most – attractions, the people that we've all talked to, they've kind of moved from the senior management kind of plan. They have all these contingency plans that they've spun up, and now they're ready to kind of push it out to execution. And that's, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. How do you execute a plan and communicate to your guests, and how do you ex execute a plan and, and bring in employees? Because this is a great time to bring in and get that input from your frontline employees as well. So, Overall, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so you can see from the guest side, um, there's a lot of ways to communicate with guests. You're, you're, there's, there's your social channels, 
press releases, um, maybe white papers, conversations that you're sharing that are, are collective. I think there's a lot of collective conversations. If you're not in any kind of attraction collective based on your, your industry or your locale, you definitely need to do that right now. Um, many FECs should gather together in a region and come up with a similar plan because um, the press that one attraction is going to get is going to be shared and disseminated elsewhere. So you are seeing this out of Florida. We're seeing that out of California. Diana, you mentioned this as well in Miami-Dade County where there's a plan that you are involved with and other government entities to, to execute in a similar fashion. Is that still happening right now? So um, the goal of the director is that we want to make sure we open with, uh, there are a lot of Miami attractions, and we belong to a lot of things like the GMCD. Uh, we, we belong to Florida Attractions Association. So uh, obviously AZA, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So we want to make sure that we're consi consistent with the industry. We don't want to just open now and then no other zoos open or no other Miami attraction and we're the only one there. So we kind of want to open at the same time. So what we're creating is we're creating a task force that's with um, Miami attractions. Now, the museums and gardens created their own task force, so now we're creating one um, with about four attractions just so that we have a cohesive guest experience. It's a way of us training the guests that we expect you to do this here. If you see the symbol or you see kind of this type of um, area, then this is how we expect you to behave. So that's kind of how we're trying to um, in connection with each other, uh, train guests. Not, not because everybody won't go online and read all of the documentation we're going we're gonna to submit, right, or have online. That will be readily available. However, we want to help each other out in that, in that aspect and then open around the same time. Um, so that's what we're planning at least. Great. And uh, I see a lot of great questions coming in. So what we're going to do is when we get to the employee section, we'll talk about some of those questions about when do you engage your employees or when you get your frontline employees involved with the game plan. Um, and we're going to talk about how you strategize with your frontline employees right now. So obviously, Zoom and phone calls and training is, is all going to be covered today. Um, that's a really long intro and a, some great discussion. Um, but let's, let's talk first about guest engagement. What are we doing today uh, to engage our guests? And so these are your, your poll results. We had almost 120 people. How have you changed your external communication? So um, we're reaching out to guests in personal ways. Uh, the personal touch is, uh, you know, su certainly super important. A third of you are, are, are doing that. Um, you know, we're hosting virtual visitations. Uh, even for-profits are doing this. Uh, I've got a good example of one of those in a second. Um, we've created new content accessible via our general website. So it seems like we've done all the, the big things we need to do. We've changed the website. We're focusing on social media more. Um, and then some of us have actually you know, not been able to have those resources to actually make change. Uh, and that's really, that's really interesting because that's a tough scenario to be in because if everyone's at home and they're using these social media channels, uh, figuring out how to best engage with people is, is going to be challenging and tricky as you reopen. I've got some examples I want to share before we, um, we kind of turn it over to some, some more questions. But, um, just kind of best practice, I love this, Holiday World is having a digital opening day. Uh, they, they missed their opening day, so they created a digital one. Uh, my favorite part of uh, the digital opening day is that um, at 5 p.m. we could take another ride because um, there's no line. <laughs> um, I think that's really a fun uh, tongue-in-cheek way to have a, have a good time. Um, we'll send you guys all these links. Um, you can find them online. Um, the Winchester Mystery House fascinates me, and I don't go. I won't go into the story so much, but um, uh, you can go get it, take a virtual tour. And what I love about this is the revenue option here, um, the revenue call to action. You can join in their immersive tour, and then when they reopen, you're going to get a complimentary pass. I, I think that's something that um, we can start doing and having fun with. Um, and I did it. I signed up. I have a virtual tour. I have. Um, some content that I was able to uh, subscribe to through their website, um, and I think that was a pretty cool, um, cool way to do that. Um, uh, we're also seeing some really good communications come out of our industry. So uh, what I like about Deborah here, um, Deborah works with a bunch of, uh, of our customers, uh, Bronx Zoo, Phoenix Zoo, Sim, Simex, um, but, you know, really just send messages. Talk to your people, lead by example, set the standards, and then continue the conversation. I think that's a really good good play um, 
And another way that that's really great, uh, and I want to open this up to the community, is that we all know we've been on Zoom and Teams and all these areas more, but um, everybody's really embraced this um, to to build familiarity and comfort with your attraction. If you're not already hosting some custom images, please do so. But what we also want to do as a community is we want to be in this together. Um, in the Q&A and chat, if you have a virtual background that you want to share to this entire community, I don't even know, it looks like we have 6,700 people plus uh, on, the, on the meeting, um, go ahead and just throw the URL down. And then when we send out our email, um, we'll share them all with you guys. There's some really great engagement tools. Um, and, and, and speaking of engagement, Josh, uh, Diana set, set you up for this. Um, she kind of mentioned this. This is something that you posted a few weeks ago. And I, I really want you to give us some insight from your position. Um, you had stated, I don't what is this, March? Uh, so it's been over a month, and it's so valuable and pertinent information today. Uh, but upon reopening, your first guests who visit are undeniably your most loyal. These are the guests that have been waiting eagerly to come in. I used this quote, I think, a few weeks ago. Um, and I, I just want you to share your perspective of, of how you are helping attractions monitor their guest loyalty and embrace it. So um, what are your thoughts? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for bringing this up. It's actually nice to see uh, how well this has aged, even though it's only been a month. There's been a lot that's happened over the last month. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting to see uh, just how how relevant this still is today. Uh, and then if you really think about it, you know, when you do go to reopen, who are going to be the first people who walk back in your doors, through your gates, through your turnstiles? They very much are your most loyal. Uh, hopefully, if they are annual pass holders or they're members or they're even just people who just wanted to get up and get out and come visit you and to just be really thinking, you know, how much do those people mean to you? Because obviously you mean so much to them. And what are you going to do to be able to recognize that? You know, and of course, there's going to be, you know, certain, you know, pricing and promotion discussions, but this goes beyond that. And even just thinking very much getting down to the hospitality component and down to your frontline staff of what are you going to do to just simply thank those people for coming back and visiting you uh, after we've gone through such a tough time together. Uh, so definitely looking at this, uh, not just from a marketing standpoint, of course, that's certainly going to be part of the conversation, but very much from a hospitality standpoint of really just recognizing that loyalty and showing that appreciation. Uh, and another thing too is that, you know, it, it looks like a lot of places are going to start, uh, you know, of course with phased reopenings or, or more so soft openings. And if that's the case for you, this is the perfect time to just do that outreach to your annual pass holders or to your members to say, hey, we are starting the process of reopening and we'd like to invite you back as our first guests back in the door uh, and then being able to really engage those guests to be able uh, to leverage feedback. People who have visited you before during normal times, during normal operations, you've got a lot of operational procedures that are going to change. These people are probably going to be the ones who are most forgiving and the most uh, proficient in speaking up and telling you, this is what I enjoyed. This is what I appreciated. Uh, this is what could have done, uh, what could have been done better. Uh, this is what should or should not have been done at all, whatever that is, uh, but being able to tap into your, your loyal guests as your source of, of market research initially. Uh, and then, like I said, just tying in that, that hospitality and that appreciation for their return to your business. Wow. Right. Um, I'm going to jump over to Kelly because Kelly, uh, Kelly, you know, is in New Orleans and, and she brought out some past perspectives about um, living there in a post-Katrina world. And, and we did talk about what life was going to be like in the parallels, but how is this different today, Kelly? Um, what are you seeing that's different? And, and is there anything you can draw on that you could share about what engagement works best to build comfort and, and get people coming back into your location? Is there mm -hmm. other any parallels? I mean, I think maybe some, you know, from – it's about getting back to some sense of normalcy, and I think that that does speak back to what Josh is saying, where, you know, people are going to want to go to the place that makes them comfortable and that feels like things are getting back to normal. It's not just about getting out of the house. It's going to be about um, 
going back to a place where maybe you've made memories before and it's time to start making them again. <clears throat> um, certainly, I feel like there, um, one big thing is, is, is wanting to support those institutions and those places that have had a special place in your family's art, um, whether that be an attraction where you've had a lot of, uh, of good experiences, maybe it's the, the local zoo because you know that they're hurting. Um, once people are able to do that, I think that um, they're going to start going out, not just because they want to get out, but because they want to help you recover. Um, they they want to help you recover. By the same token that I, I'm going to guess that a lot of us are trying to eat local when it comes to when we make our choices, because we definitely understand how this is impacting our community. Everybody's impacted by what's going on and they want to help, but they don't know how. And maybe that'll be, I, I feel like that might be one way that they will help is that they're going to go out and, and do stuff and spend money with you um, because they want you to have your jobs back and they want, they want things to go back to normal. That's all, it, that's, that was a very post-Katrina type of thing as well. Um, never, was, never were New Orleanians more proud than after, after Katrina. And I can tell you that local was always was always a big plus. Something that something that was within the community that they were comfortable with. That's where every, that's where everybody concentrated for a while because we felt like we needed it. Thank you, Kelly. Um, one of the things that, that came up, uh, I think, from from Craig in the audience was making sure that we're focusing not only on our most loyal guests, um, but for for attractions like um, museums that maybe have docent volunteers or zoos and 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 those making sure that we you know really focus on the volunteers as well and, and recognizing them as as they're going to be a, a critical part of bringing um, things back. Maybe they're going to even carry a little bit more load uh, based on on the attraction finances. Um, so that's a great point. Thank you. Um, so one of the things also that, that we're starting to notice, and I think it's a really good way as we're thinking about how we're engaging, how we're communicating with these guests, is making sure that some of the changes, some of the new things that we're putting in place, that we effectively brand. Um, so this was a, a good example I ran across um, yesterday in my news feed is Hilton coming out and, and sharing kind of their clean stay program. Um, looks like they got a little bit of a corporate sponsorship maybe there with Lysol as well. But uh, w one of the things I think that, that's critical about this is it's, it's pulling together a bunch of these efforts together under one brand that then can be leveraged throughout. So I as a team member may be part of the Hilton Clean Stay. And while I've been trained on the, the 29 things I need to worry about, um, whenever I go into one of those rooms and I see that icon of clean stay or whatnot, one of the things I think that does is, is helps to bring back that, that my understanding of it. The, from a guest standpoint, very similar um, aspects of, of reminding them that, hey, we care about you. We're taking these steps. At, uh, uh, um, and while you might have been introduced to the program initially at um, some, some signage as you're entering the park, seeing it on the hand sanitizer machine kind of helps to reinforce that, you know what, they really are going uh, above and beyond. They've done all of these things to, to ensure my safety. Um, so I think that, that that'll help us to reinforce that experience throughout. Um, and, and really, it's just kind of leveraging that, that branding aspect of it. Yeah, and I, I love uh, how they're, they're noticing, they're, they're telling people, this is what you're used to. You're all used to this, and now this is what we're doing differently. I think there was an image that you shared with me. We're not, I don't have it ready here today, but um, about Costco, like, you you know, you have to wear masks now, and it's very, it's, it's signage that says, this is, this is what you're doing. You know, if you want to come in, you have to do these things. Um, so highlighting how things have changed is important. And Josh, um, you sent me this other really, I'm jumping ahead on a slide here, but I like this. this I, Josh, what, where is this from? Is this from a, a bowling alley? Uh, yep, Stars and Strikes. Uh, they have about uh, somewhere between 14 or so bowling centers uh, throughout the southeast. I think we've got a, a few more. They'll have 17 by the end of the year. Uh, and this really, I, I would say, reinforces this message that communicating your cleanliness standards to your guests and as far as what it is that you're doing, the message can't be overstated. You know, don't worry about communicating too much because too much is the right amount, basically. Mm. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, Matthew brought up at the beginning of this presentation when talking about what the, what the parks in China are doing, and I think this ties in really nicely, is that they're not only reinforcing the message of the additional procedures that they're doing, 
but they're reinforcing the message that cleanliness standard is nothing new to our industry and to our business. And uh, the reason why uh, this stuck out for me is right around the fourth and fifth lines or so is they actually pulled in data because this was, this by the way, was posted uh, prior to their closing. So this was around the middle of March or so as the uh, heightened, um, I would say, uh, uncertainty and anxiety started to come throughout the U.S. And they wanted to say, hey, we're staying open for now. Of course, ultimately they did, they did close. Uh, but they were able to say not only the message that everyone was sending, this is when everyone was getting that exact same email from every business that had our email address and every single company was posting a message on their website. They actually said, not only are we doing these procedures, but in 2019, we averaged over a 95% cleanliness rating in our secret shopper evaluations. So they were able to actually quantify that to say, uh, you know, look, you came to us previously, you're coming to us now, you're, you're coming to us in the future, we're absolutely following the trends and the best practices in being able to get through this crisis together, but we're not reinventing the wheel in terms of our cleanliness standard. So when we look at that, even, you know, the, the title of this webinar includes recreating trust with your guests, well, why did they trust you before? Uh, you know, so guests had, I would say, almost this passive expectation of cleanliness, it definitely was there. If you pull up TripAdvisor for your business or for any other attraction, cleanliness is going to be a common theme that comes up, whether good or bad. But it was really, I like to say, uh, prior to this, you were innocent until proven guilty. There was the ultimate understanding that you were keeping your facility to a high standard of cleanliness. Um, and that's no longer, no longer the case. Now it's the complete opposite. If our businesses had to close, it was because there was a concern of cleanliness and large gatherings and people being too close together within an environment that could be perceived as not being kept to a high um, sanitation standard. So yeah. that being able to, to pull in this type of information uh, is able to allow you to uh, restore some of that confidence and that trust in your guests. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I, I was just going to say one of, one of the other things, too, that some of my clients are doing are they're involving their staff, if possible, um, if they, uh, you know, whoever um, is, is still available right now and available to be in the facility and kind of as you get towards reopening to leverage your social media with it to be able to show what your staff is doing. Uh, I put the airline safety video in quotes here because, it, you know, everyone's everyone needs to communicate all of this in some way, shape, or form, but what are you going to do to make it stick out? So if you look at the airlines that have taken a little bit more creativity uh, in their safety videos, a little bit more entertaining, it's fun. We're a fun industry. This should not be exempt from the fun that we communicate to our guests through our marketing. Uh, so something like that allows you to get, uh, to get very creative. Um, and, and the other thing too is by engaging your guests with it and being able to continually measure the perceptions, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, allows you to uh, really uh, see if there's any difference between the standard that you're communicating, the standard that you are keeping, and how your guests actually perceive that. Uh, because if your guests come in and they just have the perception that you are not to the cleanliness standard that you want them to feel, then it doesn't matter how many procedures you're putting in place and what new protocols are in place if your guests don't see it and they don't perceive it. So making sure that all of that is being over communicated to your guests is so important. Yeah, and I think that's what's special about our industry. I mean, I would say leverage your IP if you can to have custom messages. Uh, we were joking about, you know, isn't it isn't it fun when you go on Star Tours and 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 the reminder to not use flash photography is, you know, Chewbacca go, you know, he freaks out at you when you take a picture, you know. And I I think that we can embrace this and have a little bit of fun with it. And I've seen that Typhoon Texas has had some really great little videos that they've been posting, and I, I love involving your frontline staff to, ha to be the messengers because they're going to be the messengers anyway. You might as well embrace it. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm totally going out of order, everyone. I apologize. But we're going to jump over to Diana. So, Diana, this is a good example of that. I love this. What is, what is this? And tell me about this engagement. A lot of places are doing it, but I thought it would be good to kind of tie this together and share a little bit of information on what you guys are doing at Zoom Miami. So we're doing a lot of uh, social media, marketing, education, graphics. They're all working really hard to put on content um, on our social media channels. And this is a keeper catch-up. 
So a lot of kids would love to be a keeper when they grow up. So, um, the, and, and a lot of the people are missing our animals. So these are, these are you can't really see them because of the grass on the side, but those are uh, Kuni Kuni pigs that we have. They're from New Zealand. And uh, that's Rob Lara. He's excellent with guests. He, um, he's actually one of our liaisons between animal science and, our, and operations. And um, he was just talking about quarantine. Where humans are quarantined right now, but that's not a new concept for zoos. Um, I know most of the time, or actually all of them, have to do, go through a quarantine um, process, and it, it varies in days, but most of the time it's 30 days where they have to make sure that they're, they don't have anything that they can inadvertently give to another animal. Um, so, which is kind of what we're doing now, right? We may not be showing symptoms, but we may have something to give to somebody else. So, uh, that he was just explaining kind of in a very uh, general way how quarantine is nothing different from us. Now it's just humans doing it. So I thought that was a very fun um, and good representation of some of our social media engagement with guests. You know, um, I'm going to jump on a question that we, there's some great conversation. So Claudia has been in, in the Q and A is talking a little bit about some of Colleen uh, Dillinger's blog posts about, about what is really important, what really drives um, guest sentiment. And what is the information that you need to share? I'm going to jump back to this industry update and branding. Um, so I would, this is to everybody, including anybody in the audience, really, um, do your guests really need to know what your cleaning procedures are? Uh, and that's kind of one of the, the topics. Or, or is it something else? My, my personal feeling is that maybe as a guest, I don't need to know the types of equipment you're using to clean. Um, I don't need to know that you're on some regimented schedule. What I personally need to see is see it in action. I personally just need to see that my safety needs are being met when I walk into the building. Um, and so that does mean that there's this shift. Um, you know, you might, have, you might be in an immersive attraction, but now you're gonna be in an immersive attraction that has a shift of how you operate. So what, what might that look like? Uh, Matt, this, I'm gonna jump it over to you, Matt. You, You've trained so many different folks. You have an HR perspective. Like, what what might this look like in, as people reopen? How are employees going to be the front and center as representing this comfort to your guests? Thanks, Randy. Yeah, I think one of the big things is that you may take some of those things that you used to do back of house and actually bring them front of house. So where we might say that we did things so that we didn't want the guests to see them. To see them, we wanted this this fantasy um, uh, example where people just walk in and it's beautiful and things are sparkling. Well, now we may want to, to your point, bring those front of house, and that might be a kind of a change in mindset for some of the employees. Where you know before we were saying let's not do this in front of guests. Now we're saying let's do this in front of guests because mm -hmm. we are now showing them you know our procedure. And uh, and I would agree with you that they don't need to know the step by step. They just need to know that we've thought about their, their safety before they got there and that we were doing things and putting things into place to make sure that they're doing that. And I would also say that the employees need to feel that, that way as well. As we are re-engaging with people that may have been furloughed or laid off or um, you know, even working from home, you know, if they're gonna come back to your facility, they need to know and they need to see that that same thing is happening on their behalf as well because they may be just as nervous to come back to work as your guests are to come back to your uh, facility. I think one other element of it, right, is, is also that guests may not be um, looking for or, or thinking that, hey, you communicating to me that you're clean is what's going to bring me back. Um, but I think that there's an expectation of it. Um, I think that expectation is set because they hear what other people are doing and they assume it. So whenever they reach your attraction, and if, if they don't see it demonstrated continuously, if they don't see the, your commitment to it, I think the lack of it then is what becomes the issue, more so than the fact the, that I'm okay because you, you told me of it, right? So it's, it's a little bit of, of there's an expectation that they're just going to assume um, and, and part of that's our problem, right? And, and it's a good problem to have, but we've, we've been really good stewards of that. We've had very good clean experiences. We've been very safe. Um, 
And I think one of the other things that, that Bill D'Angelo pointed out is that um, it, it's, it's also that, that balance between the, the data, I'm, I'm wiping down the handrails 10 times a day, and the emotional connection of, you know, I understand that your safety and your grandmother's safety is very important, and I care about that, and I'm taking steps to, to, to react to, uh, accordingly. And I think it goes back to, as well, a little bit of what we were talking about yesterday, where we've, we've for so long had our back of house and front of house experiences and balancing that, that need for guests to escape, which is what we're in the business of, with the fact that there's a real, that there's a reality that we need to deal with and, and, and try to, I don't know, I mean, we try to make it fun if we can, but um, we've been so used to, like Matt said, keeping all of that in the background and some of it now has to come out or else they're not going to trust us. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a big shift for the staff because they've been so used to that whole onstage backstage experience, and we're moving a lot of stuff on stage that that didn't used to go there. Um, yeah, I and you guys can see I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I, I actually went back and changed the slide on the flyer because I'm seeing some really good information. Wendy Campbell says. In their county, uh, they require to post all new procedures at public entrances. So for many of us, what those new standards are going to be are going to be dictated by, by policy and regulation from your industries. Um, so going back to the elevator comment, uh, in, in China, or Atlantis Sanya was the, the customer uh, that was discussing this. They said they have to do it. Every 15 minutes, they have to do the cleaning. And, and maybe the cleaning is theatrical cleaning, like one of the commentators or questions that we see here. It's possible, Eric, that, that it might just be theatrical, but, but if it's in line with policy, you have to do it. So I agree that we probably need to reimagine that this strategy involves what that policy and regulation is and how you execute that, because our guests are getting that information from public sources about what you are supposed to be doing. A good example, in my little town, we can reopen to 50%. And guess what? Somebody opened to greater than 50%. Someone saw them, and now all of a sudden you have a real problem because you're moving outside of policy, and people are thinking, oh, that place has moved out of policy. Whether the policy is is correct policy or not, we can maybe argue that an outdoor venue can, can, outdoor venue can have more than 50% occupancy because it's so spread out um, in certain areas. We can move our table seating areas to wider areas, so we might be able to service more guests per hour than we did previously. But it's, it's really, you want to avoid the negative social impact of doing something out of policy. Um, any thoughts on that before we, we continue on? I just wanted to say also um, with the restrooms, going back to that, um, we can go ahead and say we're going to go ahead and, and, and clean those restrooms three times um, in a day or more. Uh, but sometimes it just takes that one guest to go ahead and, and, and put toilet paper everywhere and it looks like a mess and like we didn't clean anything. So one of the things that we're taking from the restaurant industry is that you're seeing a lot when you go to the restroom. Um, obviously, a lot of us, if it's a clean rest, uh, restroom, you're okay, that's safe to eat there, right? So we want to make sure to have that same cleanliness consistently. So we're putting signs that if it needs to be serviced, call, call us um, because we do want your feedback and we could have just cleaned it. So we want to make sure that, and it could have just a couple of a family went in and that was it. So uh, that's one of the things that we're implementing to try to get that dialogue between guests and ourselves um, so that we can react quickly. And as Matt says, you know, that communication is, is key. I know we work with Matalog, so. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because our industry is awesome. Cheryl Bailey from the USS Midway is suggesting that, you know, the Monster Inc. cleaning crew could be utilized to be a very visible way of, of embracing the cleaning. And if you guys don't know, I think it's the ch in Monsters Inc., it's the Child Protection Agency, or I'm sure someone's going to get me in the Q&A. But embrace maybe this and have fun with it because you're performing uh, a duty to act, but um, involve your staff and, and maybe do it in a creative way. So um, it's in alignment with what we do as an industry, which is um, provide fun and immersive experiences. 
So awesome. Great thoughts. I, I love this slide. Um, Josh and Matt, I think maybe you guys can give some information, but we've, we've seen this really right now. It's like, uh, how do you engage your guests? I mean, you, you, you should have start now. We should have probably started, you know, weeks ago, right? Um, start communicating and understanding what your guest needs are. Um, Matt or Josh, do you guys want to share a little bit of any insight that you could offer us about how we can continue to do this? Sure. So I'll jump in. Uh, you know, anything that you can do to be able to engage your guests right now is going to be beneficial. Um, and this is uh, one thing that I have found really interesting that uh, traditionally and certainly pre-COVID, uh, guest experience and social media were always seen to be two very separate, you know, pillars and departments and, and functions. And over the last seven weeks or so, they've basically been exactly the same. Uh, so anything you can do uh, with your social media brands to be able to keep guests engaged, uh, not only to stay top of mind for them, but also to be able to solicit feedback. If you've got an email list, which I'm sure all of you do, to be able to implement some sort of guest surveys and be doing some research as far as uh, what your guests expect from you when they come back once you reopen. Um, and this is a perfect time to be able to update procedures. And by the way, some of these could be, uh, you know, Randy, I love how you came up with this term, COVID KPIs. Uh, and some of them could be just part of your general operations that, hey, now's actually a good time to be able to reflect and say, we do need to change around this element of our operation in this specific area of the business uh, for whatever reason, based off of feedback and based off of data that you're getting. So being able to connect with your guests while we're all at home uh, is, is, you know, has, has kind of a, a twofold advantage of staying top of mind for them uh, and also being able to collect data as well. And then once you've got this information, now you really have an opportunity to connect with your guests personally. Uh, with the poll that, uh, that we saw earlier, it looks like there's only a, a very small percentage of the people who are on the webinar right now who have, who have really taken that approach to be able to just say, hey, let's, let's call our guests and let's um, invite them back when, when we do reopen and let's talk to them more about the concerns that they may have had on a past visit as well as what they enjoyed. We want to make sure we know what we can reinforce uh, and what changes that they would like to see in the future. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one person says, I want to see this, so you make that change. But looking at the data and saying, all right, what are the highest areas of priority that we really need to think about? Let's call our guests and let's talk about that. Let's dive deeper and be able to get those personal opinions and personal recommendations from those people who, are, who you want to come back, who, uh, who are going to come back and visit you again. And then when you reopen, don't stop that. You want to make sure that any changes or operational uh, procedure improvements that you do put in place, you want to make sure that you're continually monitoring that as you go for any small tweaks and adjusts uh, or adjustments that you'll need to make uh, as you're getting back to full operation. Um, Tracy has a great question, and, and I'm curious about this. Uh, I'd be interested to see if anyone is allowing their their guest theme park visits to be an opportunity to share what they're grateful for throughout this. And it is an interesting message. Do you want to, as we balance immersion and escapism versus um, just pure joy that we're able to have fun and, and be in an attraction community together, um, you know, that's, that's interesting. I have seen some press that has been um, some marketing materials that are really, you know, focused around the first responder community. Matthew, I think you can share a little bit of that. I, th I think that we're starting to see that most places that are going to reopen are going to put the first responder community front and center as they reopen um, as, a, as a thank you uh, and as an opportunity to give these, these um, people that we should be putting up on a pedestal a great opportunity to reconnect and have some fun. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen that from a couple of parks that have reopened now in China, of really trying to uh, applaud that community. Um, and, and I think that, you know, not only the healthcare workers that have done so much, but other essential workers. And, and I think it does get more difficult for doing, you know, verification and proof and things like that. But um, I think it helps to demonstrate your commitment to the community. Um, the other advantage, certainly with the healthcare workers in the park, obviously, the, the, this is an audience that is well well um, trained on how to, you know, socially distance or how to interact in, in environments. And so having kind of these um, cheerleaders for the behaviors that you want other to emulate, I think will be helpful. And, and I think that that engagement continues to be fun. And, and Diana, we're going to shift gears in a second, but I do want to highlight that your zoo and many other zoos have continued to have really great engagement. Do you want to give us an update on how these engagement campaigns have gone during this time period. It's been going great. A lot of uh, a lot of parents obviously are are stuck home with the kids, right? So uh, and the kids need something to do. So Ron Miguel is our director of communication, and he's uh, created a series that we released Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And uh, the videos are not that long, but uh, they're they're very crucial in just ed educating. Um, just the general public as to what we do, the different animals we have. Uh, we had a screech owl re-release in our pine lens, um, which is our, a rare ecosystem now. So we want to we want to make sure to just continue educating and keep that conversation with our guests, um, and even our volunteers love it because they get to to kind of check up on the on their favorite animals as well. Um, and then we also have <laughs> lesson plans that go along with that. Um, so we do either activities or something that the kids can, or like arts and crafts. Yoga lesson, that's to kind of keep people um, healthy, right, and fit. So that's for Sheila. She's in Atlanta right now, and she does our, our zoo yoga. So that's a, a lion pose, and that's a great screenshot. Uh, Randy, I'm sure she appreciates that. Um, and so she, she just has uh, just fun and tries to do fine yoga poses that are animal-related, and uh, kind of keep it fun and just um, we just thought exercise would be a good thing for the community now and I guess and again keep it engaged but also relevant to them. Um, Kyle, Kyla says would sign uh, this is I'm going on a whole switch of gear here because I, I think we have so many questions coming in. Um, okay. Now I want to ask you this. So the question um, from Kyla is uh, would signage to show last cleaning of an area be helpful and so Diana, at your zoo, what do you think you're going to do? What are, what are your plans to communicate cleanliness and execution of policy? Have you guys thought through any of that yet? So we do want to create a tab on the website that talks about all of those things. Um, a lot of us know that 95% of our audience that visit zoos normally don't read the signs. Um, so it's very difficult to continue posting signs of all of these things that are very, very long for nobody to read. So what we want to do is we want to create the signage that's a little bit more um, engaging and, and we're, we've come up with very simple guest rules um, about the social distancing and about the washing your hands. And if we, we're going to have locations where we require guests to wear masks, so like masks up, maybe a little, the, the design's being, being uh, actually being created now, but maybe with an animal with a mask on, so everything's kind of themed. Um, but when it comes to protocols in the park to say, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, I think that's, that's a, a lot of signage that will probably be missed. We will have it in certain areas. Um, for example, the website, we may have it like when, we, when you first enter the zoo and certain certain signage in the restroom, but I think that it's very difficult to communicate everything that we're doing. We rather than see it. And if they're not seeing it, I'd rather give you a number to call us so that we can rectify the situation. I think that's going to be much more impactful um, than to say these are all the things that you may or may not see us do. So uh, that's kind of our take on it right now. Yeah, I, it's interesting because I think this is where, um, you know, we uh, one of our most important ass assets that we have, and I talked a little bit about IP, and I mean, this is a great example of using your IP. You know, Ron is part of your intellectual property, so to speak, and that he's a spokesperson. He's very recognizable. He's on TV, and he does regular um, rather regular shows and videos. But, but Matt, you're, you're going you're gonna to tell me immediately that, you know, your number one asset are your employees. And understanding how to engage your employees properly 
um, is really going to be key and paramount as we reopen. Um, so, Matt, what are your top two or three? You got to do this when you reopen in terms of of reengaging your employees who might be furloughed. They might be sitting at home right now. What what are the top three things we ought to be doing right now with our our team? Well, I think first of all, when you look at the the attitude be, uh, to reengage our guests, it's really a lot of the same things that we re need to do to reengage our employees. Right? We're talking to our guests through social media. We should be doing the same thing with our employees. We're trying to educate our guests. We should be doing the same thing with our employees. Um, to me, I think there's there's three areas that when you look at what every human being on this planet needs, those are the things that we really need to start with when it comes to engaging our employees. Everybody needs positive attention. So how can you reach out and provide some attention to your team members? You know, it's it's not enough to just say, hey, call us if you need us. You know, reach out and email us. That's not really enough right now. We have to be more proactive with that. So we need to be the ones to reach out and call someone. You know, and I, I see you put the the slide up again with the with the Zoom meetings, and I think there's there's definitely a real thing of, of Zoom burnout that some people are are feeling right now. Um, so pick up the phone, right? I've I've engaged with so many people over the phone over the last month or two, and it's been really really refreshing, quite frankly, uh, because you don't have to look a certain way, right? You don't have to think about how you look and and watch yourself speaking. Um, you can just kind of relax and have a conversation. And I've had so many people that, you know, at the end of those conversations just say, wow, this, this is really what I needed. This was really inspiring. And a lot of times, all I really did was listen, right? So I think when we're providing positive attention to people, part of that is, is us just listening to them, right? Because so many of our, our team members and really ourselves, we've been, we've been going through this, this uh, process of grief where, you know, maybe we deny that it was happening or, you know, we got really angry or, you know, we're, we're feeling like there's something we can do to get out of it or we're feeling depressed. And then finally you get to the, to the end uh, of the cycle of grief and then you get to acceptance. And I would think that most of the people on this webinar today have probably gotten to that acceptance point of, of grief because you've gone through it all and you're thinking, well, this is what it is. We need to move forward. We need to engage our guests. We need to engage our employees. And maybe you got there really quickly. But I would also say that maybe your team members didn't. Maybe your team members are still feeling denial. Maybe they're, they're still feeling angry. So one of the best ways to, uh, you know, deal with that is really just to talk to them, you know, engage with them, be empathetic. And I think that's all part of providing some positive attention. I think we also need to connect with people and allow people to connect with other employees. So important to connect with you as an employer, but really important to also, you know, get them connected with people that they are normally working with side by side. Um, you know, th there's such a social aspect to what we do that if we can get people connected, you know, playing some, some Zoom games, not too many, you don't want to have burnout, but, uh, you know, getting them together, at least in, in some ways, uh, maybe get the, getting them on a phone call with with one of their friends, or you know, whatever. It's it's about you facilitating those connections. And then the last thing I think is really important is about purpose. You know, people have to understand what their purpose is when they come back to work, and we need to also facilitate ways to, that they can, um, per, you know, have some purpose right now. So. Some of the things that I've seen people do certainly are, you know, um, organizing volunteer trips. Or uh, I think Six Flags just had a lot of their managers go out and thank the frontline workers. They, they put on their capes and they went out to grocery stores and they, they were thanking the people who were out there, you know, providing us the opportunity to buy food so that our, we could feed our families. And I thought that was just a great way not only to give back to the community, but also to kind of bring your team together, socially distance, of course, uh, wearing masks, wearing gloves, doing all the right protective things, but getting people um, an opportunity to share some gratitude, to feel some purpose, I think that's really, really critical. So those are my top three things is provide some positive attention, connect with people, and give them some purpose so that when they come back, they'll, they'll be ready to, ready to go and, um, and ready to be productive. I'm, I'm I'm trying to do a mic drop with my mic here, but I can't. It's connected. <laughs> it's connected to my. Um, I think I, great, great points, Matt. I, I those are such valuable. I I I can definitely tell you that sense of purpose is 
is we're all, I think I mentioned this previously, we're all extroverts in this industry. We love connections. We love positivity. These are things that are innate in our core uh, if we're in this industry. But finding purpose while you're, you're maybe sitting at home or you're, you're not able to engage with your guests is, is a little difficult. I would, I, I, Atlanta Sanya, they took their lifeguards who can no longer perform that function and they repurposed them because it gave them a mission. It gave them a, an activity to do that they could see. So a lot of it was, you know, beautification. Uh, I think that's really important. Diana, I got to go to you and say, um, what are you doing and what's your strategy and when are you going to engage? We had a great question from Lee Smith. When are you going to engage your teams to give them that purpose? Uh, I'd love to hear from you and what you're doing at the zoo. Um, sure. So I, I miss thanking Gateway for giving us all of this content because we are on this. A lot of us from Zoo Miami are on here every week to try to learn what the industry is doing. So thank you so much for that. And once we've developed that reopening plan, you need to be engaging your employees now. So for us, what we're doing is um, it's important to our employees are so used to being part of the decision making process and they haven't really heard from us in about a week, I'm not a week, I'm sorry, a month, right? They've been gone for about a month. One of the things that I tried to do, Carol B, my partner tried to do, and a lot of other managers was call every single one of them. You didn't have to ask them, you know, um, you're reporting to work on this time, a date or what, they're already getting that. It's just, how are you? How are your family doing? The, the first communication from us shouldn't have been, this is when you're gonna report back to work. So that's number one, they should have already heard from us. Uh, which we did. I called every single one of my employees and I have over 60 of them um, and, or I texted them because that, that might be their preference. Um, I also called every single one of them, uh, the volunteers. We treat them very similar to, uh, to um, employees. I'm still not done. There's 125 of them. So it's taking me a little while. Um, sometimes I've actually gone to one of their houses and, and obviously practicing social distancing, being outside of their, their yard because they haven't seen uh, a lot of their uh, people that they, they know for, for over 45 days in some cases. So kind of getting their feedback and engaging them that way. So now that the, the reopening um, plan is in the director's uh, desk and being reviewed, she's giving us authorization to go ahead and start releasing some of the, the uh, uh, protocols and guidelines that we'll be implementing. So for example, today we had a meeting this morning with a lot of the uh, frontline managers and we said, okay, your staff, you're, you're going to report to, to work on Monday. Um, you guys, as managers, will start being incorporated into these reopening procedures to get first your input, because we need to get the managers and supervisors input first before frontline. Um, and, and we're already doing the fire cycle build out to see how that's going to look. Um, but the frontline employees, what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and be repurposed and work with other areas. That's a good thing, because then they can go ahead and appreciate what the other teams do. Sometimes we take that for granted. So they're gonna be uh, zookeepers at animal science, animal health, nutrition center. And in some cases, we have some parks. We are not just Zoo Miami standalone attraction. We belong to the Parks Department of Miami-Dade County. During the state of the open, they need help. We're gonna go ahead and deploy three guest service representatives. That does one of two things. What, it, it helps the, uh, the attraction uh, because they need staff, but it also gives the employee a different perspective. So we're so used to Zoom Miami, Zoom Miami, and that, the way we do things, well, here's the way Deering does things. And then they can come back and report to us and say, hey, we really like how they did this, or we probably should change this because we're a little different. So we're going to be engaging them about how, what, what was your feedback? How did you like that? Um, I had a Zoom call with the admissions team the other day, and I said, hey, this is, I just set up a Zoom call so that you guys can see each other and just communicate. I knew what was coming. That's why I made it an hour and a half. There was a pause in between there and I said, go ahead, you can ask me about reopening. And they just started with questions and questions and questions. So a lot of the, the answers would have been, I don't know, I'm waiting for us to get together to make sure that these three options you guys like. In some cases I said, well, we're gonna take away this. And they said, well, why? We're okay with doing that. Oh, you are? Okay, we'll put it back in. So for us, it's important to, once we finish with the managers, talk to frontline because they're so used to being part of that decision-making process anyway. So we're going to re-engage that. Um, and then also, it's not just about work, work, work. One of the things that we enjoy doing is um, we enrich animals, so we want to enrich our, our employees as well. So we do kind of surprise animal encounters as well for them. So 
So we might have like a porcupine show up um, after a lineup, so we do lineups every morning. Um, and, and then they get to learn a little bit about that animal. Uh, they haven't seen their flamingo, which they've seen grow up uh, for, for, for months now. He's, he's now almost pink. Uh, we had a keeper uh, come to their, their location and talk to them about kind of all about flamingos and that one in particular. And they, they take ownership over, it, over that. And those of us that have been going to do take little videos of like the stable antelope baby and this is how it's growing. So, so that they keep engaged and it's important with our mission. That's our mission, right? Conserving these animals and, and helping them, uh, helping people um, uh, connect, care and conserve, right? Them for the future. So that's kind of all of the different things that we're doing. So we are connecting with them right now. And we have been, we, didn't, we never really stopped. We just have a little, a slight uh, longer gap there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's really interesting to understand what that audience is, Diana. And um, I put this slide up because we had a great question come in from Kristen, who says, at my museum, we've kept all of our frontline staff, um, having them work, uh, you know, um, on various tasks, giving them purpose. So, Matt, they're, they're, they're giving them purpose at, at this museum. But, but um, Kristen wants a little bit more uh, for them to do, so, so training. So, you can imagine if this is your world, right? If, if most of your teams are furloughed, if some of them have reduced hours, if some of them, you, you know, you've been able to continue on, this is responses from our audiences, where can you get good training? I, I'm going to jump out first and say um, it's amazing the content that's available for free. Um, if you're a member of IAPA or AZA or AM, there are webinars everywhere. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody, if you found some amazing content, that you know that is, is, is great and, and is valuable to you and to your team members, um, please share it with us. There'll be an email that Matthew and I will send out, um, reply to it, or throw it in the Q&A, um, just a link, or let us know. We will share them with everybody. So Kristen, I would say um, if your staff is furloughed or if your staff is looking for opportunities, um, I would look inward to our community to find resources because um, you can get like a, an MBA in attraction management right now, just online. Um, I mean, I, I can be on a webinar. I mean, you guys are all nodding your heads and smiling. I could see your videos. So we could all be doing this now. So Kristen, um, we'll, we'll collect as many URLs as possible and get them out to you. If anybody has a great suggestion, um, let us know as well. Um, em, employee feedback is, 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 is huge right now. And I, I want to mention Avius. I love th this is just generic employee well-being, and this is everything Diana you were just talking about. Um, there's nothing more valuable right now than a personal phone call, especially to a staff member that is furloughed. Um, some of us are starting to go back to work, but many of us are in uh, locales that we can't open because of government rules and policy. Um, this is a great tool you can send to your team. Um, you can get some good information, how they're feeling, um, and uh, get employee sentiment, get employee feedback. Um, you can do it this way. You can do it personally. You can do it um, through Zoom. There were some questions that were coming in about how do we um, train and retrain our staff. I'm going to start by saying go to places like OSHA, look at their guidelines. Um, you can see the link at the bottom here understand what is going to be necessary as you reopen, and then look to do things that are visual that have your employees' comfort in mind. This is from uh, CK Systems. Or they're a great team that we work with at Gateway. But I like this as Guardian Countertop Sneeze Guard. Um, we got to be thinking of our staff. A lot of times when you see these barriers, you're thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being protected by the employee. This is the, the complete opposite. Your employee at this touch point is contacting five, 600 people an hour. How do you make them feel safe and comfortable? Get feedback from your employees. Look at tools like this. Um, we're going to, Matt, I want to go back to you, Matt Heller. Um, when, how might reopening now in a post-COVID world, um, what does this look like? Is it like an entire restart of your training protocols? What are your, what's your advice on, how do you reopen and train staff? 
Well, I think one of the big things is that we don't really know exactly what this is going to look like, right? I mean, some places are, are starting to reopen or consider reopening, but I think you, you do have to at least start from a baseline of thinking this is, a, this is a kind of a refresh and a restart, right? So if you did have people, if you're your own place, like a, like a Zoo Miami, you've had people that, you know, your, your zookeepers, you know, most of them are still there, but you've had people that have not been working potentially. So you know, you have to bring them back and not assume that they've forgotten a lot, but, you know, at least at least give them some refreshers and, and let them let them kind of uh, get back into the groove, if you will. Um, I think and I saw one of the questions about, you know, the, the new procedures. And I think if you have those written out and if, if you have those um, those really specific procedures, then I think it's about starting from square one. Right. If this is a new procedure, if this is a new uh, protocol that you're using, then, you know, you, you almost assume that they don't know anything about that cleaning so that you can really start from a from a fresh place. I think, you know, when you look at, you know, ride training and things like that, you know, if, if your state or your local government says that they have to be certified, then you have to look at those regulations and do they have to be recertified if they haven't been doing it for a while. So, you know, those type of things have to definitely be looked at. Um, but I would also say that let's not just focus on our front line, we have to look at our supervisors, we have to look at our managers, we have to look at, you know, whatever level of leadership you're in, so that everybody is on the same, on the same page, right? Um, we're going to have new uh, procedures, we're going to have new protocols, and everybody needs to be on the same page. So it's not just enough to train the front line, the, the management team has to be part of that. And going back to something we talked about earlier, you know, getting your team members involved, and I know Diana talked about this, Matthew talked about this, and I can't stress it enough, to get your team members involved, not just so that they know what those procedures are, but they've bought into it. Just to reiterate what something uh, Diana was talking about, you know, these are things that they're going to be um, fulfilling. They're going to be doing these things. So it's really important that they have some buy-in. And again, that kind of gives them purpose and, and, uh, and, and a leg up when it comes to actually explaining to the guests what they're doing. Um, so I just wanted to kind of re re reiterate that point. I thought that was a really important one. Hey, Matt, one of the other questions that had come up, and I was just wondering, um, as I mentioned, I'm an analytical person, so this is one of the things I struggle at sometimes. But you know, one of the things that we're going to be potentially going to have are, are employees that are having to, to interact with folks in, in maybe unpleasant situations, right? There, there may be situations where we start, you know, enforcing you have to wear a mask or you might have to, to, to do temperature checks. And, and these are really kind of negative situations that we might have to address. Are there any thoughts that you have on kind of how, how we gear our employees up to, to be in those awkward situations? Well, sure, Matthew. And, you know, you and I both worked at Universal. We know that there's always uh, uh, uncomfortable situations. Whether you're telling a person that their, their child can't get on a ride because they're too short, or you're telling them they can't smoke in a certain area because the smoking area is over there and they're in the middle of the midway. So I think you use the same kind of tactics, except, you know, bringing in even a little bit more empathy and a little bit more compassion. Um, you know, you, you don't want to come up to someone and say, I got to take your temperature. Right. Um, but, you know, we're all trying to be safe here. We're all doing this. We're all in this together. And and I do think there's going to be at least some of that feeling that, oh, they're taking my temperature because that's what they, that's just what they have to do. And maybe that's been already communicated through social media. So that's kind of been that's kind of been um, uh, addressed. But I also think it's, it's kind of the same process. Right. You give them the tools to uh, address it in a very compassionate and, and empathetic way. And if something happens where they are upset, then immediately being able to call somebody and, and get back up in there, I think is really important because you don't want to have your team members in a position where they're having to defend, you know, something that is, is so critical to everybody's health that they're going to get defensive too, right? Now, at the same time, they probably have a, a better uh, backup for that because this is the regulation. Like, we didn't make this mm -hmm. up. Wherever you work, Zoo Miami, Universal Studios, Disney World, we didn't make this up. We're going by the government regulation. So this is what we have to do to make sure everybody's safe. At the same time, you balance that with people that just want to get into your facility. They want to go see the tigers, whatever it is, and they're going to be amped up potentially. So you do have to balance that. And, you know, I think it's, it's really about, you know, approaching it empathetically first so that you're, you're bringing their potential defenses down so that when you get into the conversation, that's all it is, is a conversation. It's not, it's not a us versus them. It's a, we're all in this together. You know, you, you talked about, um, 
you know, the facts earlier and, you know, reacting emotionally. And one of the things that I found works well when somebody is amped up is you can get angry with them, but not at them, right? Like you're saying, oh man, that really upsets me too. And it's really hard for people to uh, um, uh, argue with you when you're agreeing with them, right? So the same, same kind of uh, situation with the, the monster under the bed, I think, you know, that same thought process can be used when someone's wondering why you're taking their temperature. And I think also, Matt, it's important that you, that you very carefully determine who it is that's going to be doing that, right? So um, who are you going to have doing those sorts of things? It can't, it, not everyone's going to be comfortable with it. And, and from a work standpoint, yeah, we all have to do things that we don't want to. I don't, of course, ever, because I love every aspect of what I do. But there's, there's a difference between not that I don't want to do something and I'm not comfortable with doing something. And I think as management, that's going to be one of those things that people may not be comfortable with. And I think you're going to have to address that. And they may not be the best, the best people to do it because they won't be able to handle the situation exactly the way you want to handle it. It's pretty delicate, right? You're not just dealing with somebody smoking. You're dealing with someone who may very well be sick and it's a little bit personal. So um, I think that your management, you know your folks better than anybody and be very careful about who is asked to, do, to perform that task um, so that you have faith that they'll do it with the, right, with the right touch or not touch, as the case may be. Yeah, and Kelly, and I want to, to really um, emphasize to be consistent. You know, have consistency. Bring in Diana is, is, is texting here. To me, you know, um, bring all your teams together. Have one vision, one mission. Get all those, any silos that you may have, this is the best time in the world to get rid of all those silos in your, in your attraction um, or, or your business. So have one, one mission, one, one message. Um, have all the teams on the same page. Um, and then not only that, communities like this should have one mission, one message as well. Talk to other people in your community. Talk to zoos. Talk to the other museums. There was a, a great mention here um, um, about, you know, museums sharing content with other museums. Please consider doing that. Let us know and we will share them with everybody so that, um, the, like the George O'Keefe Museum is, is have a weekly sh a series for customer service. That's a great example. We should share that with the entire community as a whole uh, because we are all in this together. Um, I want to thank everybody for your amazing questions. We will do our best to get all those questions answered. We'll send you a follow-up um, message as well. Um, I want to thank uh, the team at Gateway, Kelly and Matthew and Bill and Greg, Diana Vega. Thank you for your insight and, your, and, and all that information. I'm, your email's going to be on this as well. I'm sure you're going to welcome some, some emails. Uh, I want to thank, again, the guys at Attraction Pros, Josh and Matt. Um, Visit them. They've got some great content coming up. Um, please join us next week. We're going to talk about pricing the guest experience. Um, here's a link that you can go to. You can scan that with your phone. Um, but we, we thank you guys very much for being with us. We love you guys all. We're all in this together, and we are here for you. For you. Everybody on this call is here for you. So if you want to reach out to us, if there's any Zoom meetings, or if you just want to have a virtual happy hour with us, or just you want to talk to anybody, We'd love to get together. Uh, any questions um, or comments, uh, feel free to hit us up at these channels. But thank you guys very, very much for joining us today. Be safe, and we'll see you next Wednesday.